Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're getting into something truly foundational, uh, especially if you're starting out in nursing, professional nursing practice. We're diving into that crucial first chapter of Lewis's Medical Surgical Nursing, the 12th edition. Our goal here, to really cut through the noise, give you that head start on understanding not just what nursing is, but the why and the how. You know, developing your professional identity, getting those core competencies down. Think of it as your roadmap. Yeah, and what's really fascinating, I think, is just how dynamic professional nursing is. It's not static at all. It's always evolving. And this chapter, well, it lays the groundwork for pretty much every clinical situation you're going to face. It's the blueprint, really, for safe, patient-centered care and using that critical thinking muscle. Okay, so let's jump right in. What is nursing? I mean, really, the textbook says it's an art and a science, heart and mind. Historically, you've got Florence Nightingale, right? Putting the patient in the best condition for nature to act. A classic. <laughs> and Virginia Henderson, focusing on helping patients get back their independence. Still yeah, relevant. Definitely. But the modern definition, the 2010 ANA one, is much broader. It talks about protection, promotion, optimization of health, uh, prevention, alleviation of suffering, and advocacy for individuals, families, communities, even whole populations. That scope is huge. It really underscores that the core, no matter the setting, is holistic, patient-centered care. Yeah. And the career paths. Wow, they're so diverse. You might start as an entry-level generalist, you know, associate or baccalaureate degree, focusing on direct care. Right, the bedside nurse we often picture. Exactly. But then many nurses specialize. Yeah. They get certifications, critical care, med surge, geriatric, you name it. And then you have APRNs, Advanced Practice Registered Nurses. They've got master's or doctoral degrees. They nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, often working almost like primary care providers. So lots of levels. Lots of levels. And it all circles back to the ANA's standards of professional nursing practice. Those really guide the ethical, evidence-based, collaborative care we're all striving for. Okay, so that's the internal structure, kind of. But what about the outside world? What forces are shaping nursing now? Well, expanding knowledge and technology that's massive. Think genetics guiding cancer treatment. Amazing stuff, but it brings ethical questions too and uh, issues of access. Who gets this advanced care? Good point. And then there's the diverse populations we serve. People are living longer, often with multiple chronic conditions. So care coordination becomes absolutely key. And cultural competence too, right? With increasingly diverse communities, understanding different needs, maybe challenges faced by immigrants without healthcare access? Vital, absolutely vital. And then there's consumerism. Patients are more engaged, they want more control, they demand high quality, coordinated, affordable care. They're looking up information online. Yeah, so our role includes helping them sort through all that information too. Definitely, which leads right into healthcare financing. This is a huge driver. Costs are high, the population's aging. You mentioned the Medicare PPS system. Right, the prospective payment system. Hospitals get a flat fee for a diagnosis. So efficiency and quality are paramount. It's not fee for service anymore, not for many things. It's value-based purchasing now. Exactly. Payment is tied to quality, safety, patient satisfaction, using evidence-based practice, and those serious reportable events, or SREs. Like preventable falls or pressure injuries. Th those can actually hit the hospital's bottom line, reduce payments. Wow. Okay, so finance drives policy. Often, yes. Think about the Affordable Care Act, ACA. Big goals were increasing access and promoting things like accountable care organizations, ACOs, to better coordinate care, especially for the chronically ill. Nurses are central to making those work. And supporting all this are the professional nursing organizations. Absolutely. The ANA, specialty groups like AACN or ONS, they set standards, ethics codes, support research, advocate for nurses, and programs like the Magnet Recognition Program, they highlight hospitals that really support their nurses, which, guess what? leads to lower turnover and better patient outcomes. It proves investing in nursing pays off for patients. Okay, that paints a really clear picture of the environment. So let's shift gears now to the tools you'll need within that environment, the core competencies. Right, the QSEN Institute Quality and Safety Education for Nurses identified six key ones, patient-centered care, interprofessional partnerships, safety, quality improvement, informatics, and evidence-based practice. Let's focus on a couple of those. First, Patient-centered care. This sounds straightforward, but it's deep. It's about holistic, compassionate, coordinated care. Really honoring the patient's needs, preferences, values. Well, let me give them a full partner. And their caregivers, too. 
Exactly. And this is where, for you listening, clinical judgment becomes so critical. It's not just about knowing facts. It's your ability to make sense of a situation, make decisions, solve problems using your nursing knowledge, prioritizing problems, finding the best solutions for safe care. And you develop that through experience, absolutely, yeah. but also through things like case studies, simulations. Uh, the textbook really emphasizes that learning process. How do we structure that thinking process, though? Well, that's where frameworks come in. The most fundamental is the nursing process. ADPIE, Assessment, Diagnosis, Planning, Implementation, Evaluation. Right, ADPIE, we hear that acronym a lot. We do, and it's a cycle, remember, not just linear steps. Assessment is gathering all that data, subjective, objective. Diagnosis, or like the book often says, the clinical problem, is analyzing that data to pinpoint the issue, maybe risk for infection or acute pain. Okay. Then you plan, set measurable outcomes. What do you want the patient to achieve? And what specific nursing interventions will get them there? Like for pain, the outcome might be patient reports pain less than 300 and, and interventions could be administering meds, repositioning. Exactly. Implementation is doing those things. Mm -hmm. And evaluation is crucial. Did it work? Did the patient meet the outcome? If not, you reassess, adjust the plan. It's continuous. And this all gets documented in nursing care plans, right? Yep great learning tools. Mm -hmm. In practice, they're mostly electronic now, but they lay out the problems, the goals, the interventions, the rationale, the why behind your actions. You customize them for each patient. Okay. So that process guides care. Where does that care happen? That brings us to the continuum of patient care. Nurses are everywhere. Acute care, like in the hospital, then maybe transitional care, like rehab after, say, a spinal cord injury, and then long-term care or home care. And there's a huge focus now on care coordination during those transitions. Moving between settings is risky. Yeah, preventing errors, preventing readmissions. The textbook example about the propranal dose difference during admission, that's a perfect illustration. Catching that prevents a serious error. That's the nurse's role. Absolutely critical. And how we deliver care varies too. Different models, maybe team care where the RN leads LPNs and APs, or total patient care mm -hmm. where the RN does pretty much everything for their assigned patients. And telehealth is booming. It really is. Using phones, video calls, apps mm -hmm. for triage, monitoring, education. It expands access significantly. Amidst all this, what about the family? The caregivers? Ah, yes. Supporting caregivers. So important. They're not just visitors. They're part of the team. They link the patient to their life outside, help with decisions, with daily activities. They advocate. We need to assess their needs too, give them information, listen without judgment, sometimes bring in a social worker or chaplain. The book mentions their presence during procedures, even CPR. Yes. Even if the outcome isn't good, being there can help caregivers process, reduce anxiety, avoid lingering doubts later. It's about compassionate, family-centered care. That's powerful. Okay, moving from the family to the broader team, interprofessional partnerships. You can't do nursing in a silo. No way. You have to work effectively with physicians, pharmacists, therapists, social workers, mm -hmm. the whole team. Collaboration is key, sharing knowledge, sharing responsibility, making decisions together. And the nurse is often the coordinator, right? In rounds, making referrals. Often, yes. And the absolute cornerstone of that collaboration is good communication. Which can break down easily. It can. That's why we have tools like SBAR. Situation, background, assessment, recommendation. It's a structured way to communicate critical information concisely and factually. Can you give a quick example? Sure. Situation. Dr. Jones, this is Nurse Smith. I'm calling about Mr. Davis in room 204. He has new onset atrial fibrillation. Background. He's two days post-op bowel resection. Has a history of mitral valve disease. Assessment. His heart rate is 124, BP 9060. He's dizzy. Recommendation. I think he needs an IV medication, and I need you to come evaluate him now. Clear, concise, action-oriented. Got it. Exactly. And then there are things like patient handoffs, passing info during shift changes or transfers. Mm -hmm. Needs to be thorough, allow questions, maybe a readback confirmation. Yeah, huddles. Quick daily meetings, discuss concerns, safety issues, updates, really improves care quality. The book mentions post-fall huddles to figure out what happened and how to prevent it next time. Okay, so in this team environment, RNs often lead. That yeah. involves delegation and assignment. What's the difference? They sound similar. Good question. They're often confused. Delegation is when an RN authorizes another qualified person, like an LPN or assistive personnel, AP, to perform a specific nursing task that's beyond their usual role, but under the RN's supervision. Okay, beyond their usual role. Right. But crucially, you cannot delegate anything requiring independent nursing judgment. 
no initial assessments, no core patient teaching, no evaluating the effectiveness of care. So an LPN could change a dressing after the RN did the first assessment. Correct. Assignment, on the other hand, is directing someone, an LPN or AP, to do something that is part of their regular job description and within their scope of practice. Like taking routine vital signs or helping a patient ambulate. Exactly. Those are assignments. But remember, even when you delegate or assign, you, the RN, are still ultimately responsible for that patient's overall care. And there are rules for delegation, right? Five rights? Yes. The five rights of delegation. Crucial. Right task, right circumstances, right person, right directions and communication, and right supervision and evaluation. You got to ask yourself those questions every time. Is this appropriate now for this patient with this staff member? Did I explain it clearly and can I follow up effectively? That's a great framework. Keeps patients safe. Which brings us nicely to building that foundation of safety and quality. We know preventable medical errors are a huge issue. We hear about serious reportable events, SREs, or never events. Right. These are things that just shouldn't happen if proper care is given. A stage 3 pressure injury that develops in the hospital, a fall that causes serious injury, things like that. And the Joint Commission has National Patient Safety Goals, NPSGs, to help prevent these. Exactly. They're evidence-based solutions. Mm -hmm. Things like using two patient identifiers, name, and date of birth. Improving team communication, especially for critical results using medicines safely labeling, special precautions for anticoagulants, medication reconciliation. Using alarms safely too, right. That relates to alarm fatigue. Big time. Responding promptly, not just turning them off because they're annoying. Alarm fatigue is a real danger. Other goals focus on preventing infections, hand hygiene, careful catheter care, identifying safety risks like suicide or falls, and preventing surgical mistakes with things like the timeout procedure. And nurses are key in preventing failure to rescue. What's that exactly? Failure to rescue, or FTR, is when there's a delay or just a failure in recognizing clinical deterioration. Subtle changes may be leading to a bad outcome, like death or disability. That could have been prevented. So it's about vigilance, noticing those subtle changes and acting fast, activating response teams. Precisely. You are often that crucial first line of defense. And this ties directly into quality improvement, QI. QI programs are systematic efforts involving the whole team to monitor, assess, and continuously improve care quality. It's not a one-off fix. It's ongoing. And how do we know if QI is working? How do we measure quality? Great question. Patient outcomes are key. And that's where the National Database of Nursing Quality Indicators, NDNQI, comes in. It collects data on nursing-sensitive indicators, things like RN staffing levels, nurse education, patient fall rates, pressure injury rates, infection rates, even nurse job satisfaction. Why nursing sensitive? Because these metrics are directly influenced by the quantity and quality of nursing care. The data clearly shows, for instance, that better staffing and higher nurse education levels correlate with better patient outcomes, fewer falls, fewer infections. It demonstrates nursing's impact. Okay, that makes sense. So we have all this data, these standards. How do we manage it all? That leads us to the power of information and evidence. Absolutely. Nursing is incredibly information intensive. And technology, well, it's transformed everything. Planning, delivering care, documentation, evaluation. What are some of the big advantages? Efficiency, definitely. Okay. Quick access to information, clinical decision support tools right at the bedside, patient education materials, better communication too, secure texting, video chats with specialists, email. And safety benefits. Huge ones. Medication administration apps that flag potential errors. Computerized provider order entry CPOE gets rid of messy handwriting errors. Sensor tech for falls. Reminder systems. But with all this tech comes responsibility, especially around privacy, PHI, and IPA. Critical. You must protect patient information. The textbook highlights this with that social networking example. Ah, yes. The student posting detailed patient info on social media, even in a closed group. Exactly. Even if you think it's private, it might not be. And the consequences. Disciplinary action, getting kicked out of your program, even legal trouble. The rule is simple. Share your personal learning experience if you must, but never include any identifying patient information. None. That's a crucial warning. And the biggest use of informatics is probably the electronic health record, EHR. By far. It's the computerized patient chart shared across the team, ideally following the patient wherever they go. Still challenges, though, cost, complexity, getting different systems to talk to each other, but it's the standard now. Okay, so we have information systems. Now, what about the evidence that guides our practice? Right, the final piece, 
evidence-based practice, EBP. This is absolutely central to modern nursing. EBP is basically a problem-solving approach. It combines three things. The best available evidence from research and quality data, your own clinical expertise and judgment, and the patient's and caregiver's preferences and values. The goal, optimal patient outcomes. So it's not about doing research yourself, necessarily. Not usually for the bedside nurse. Oh. It's about using the research findings closing that gap between what we know from research and what we actually do in practice. How do you do that? Are there steps? Yes, there's a process, usually six steps. Yeah. First, ask a clinical question, often using the PICOT format. PICOT. Patient population, intervention, comparison, outcome, time. The book uses an example for abdominal surgery patients. Mm -hmm. Does splinting the incision with an elastic binder intervention compared to using a standard pillow comparison reduce postoperative pain outcome? Okay, so you frame the question. That Step two. Search for the best evidence. Databases, journals, you, you gotta assess if the source is credible. Step three, critically appraise and synthesize that evidence. Ask, what did they find? Is it reliable? Is it valid? Will it actually help my patients? Maybe the evidence shows binders work better for obese patients, for example. Makes sense, then you use it. Step four, implement the evidence. Combine it with your clinical judgment on what the patient wants. Maybe you develop a new protocol, involve the team. Step five, Evaluate the change. Do pain scores actually improve after implementing binders? Monitor those outcomes. And finally. Step six, share the outcomes. Let others know what you found. Newsletters, presentations, maybe even publishing. And you'll see EBP woven throughout your textbook, those evidence-based practice boxes, the asterisks and the references pointing to research. It's everywhere. Wow, okay. That's a lot to take in from just one chapter, but it really sets the stage. So pulling it all together for you listening, what are the big takeaways? Professional nursing is dynamic. It demands compassion, yes, but also strong science, critical thinking, and a real commitment to lifelong learning. Right, and mastering those core competencies, patient-centered care, teamwork, safety, quality, informatics, EBP, it's not optional. It's essential. Your clinical judgment, that's your most powerful tool. You'll sharpen it with experience, using frameworks like the nursing process. And remember, you're the patient's advocate, that crucial link coordinating their care. Which really leads to a final thought or maybe a question for you to ponder. How will your unique mix of knowledge, your critical thinking, your compassion, how will that become not just a job, but a real force for shaping health? For individuals, for communities, yeah. what responsibility, but also what incredible opportunity does that place on you as you step into this profession? Something definitely worth thinking about. Thank you for joining us for this deep dive. We really hope this last minute lecture gives you a solid foundation as you embark on becoming an outstanding professional nurse.